Welcome to the MOOC Tailored Materials and Enzymes for Industrial Processes. My name is Robert Kulist, and this is the first unit of the basic module, and it deals with the question, what's an enzyme? So this MOOC is about the ways to immobilize enzymes and use this immobilization as a strategy to increase the performance of enzymes in multi-cascade reactions, which is a very powerful approach to use enzymes in, bio, in industrial biocatalysis. So the basic module is intended to introduce you to a few basic concepts. So just to recapitulate, what, what is an enzyme? What does it do? What, which properties of an enzyme are important? How can we uh, produce an enzyme for research purposes? How can we pr produce it in a way that we can change the gene? And um, then how can we also alter a protein? So for instance, if the activity of an enzyme is not sufficient or the selectivity, then the basic module will introduce you to a rational enzyme design and also direct enzyme evolution. So to start, let's go back to the basic question, what's an enzyme? And this unit will give you different answers to this question. So the first answer is an enzyme is a catalyst. So let's go to a very simple example. Um, sugar. So I think most of us have sugar in our kitchen. And I think most of us actually have too much sugar in our kitchen. So, and this sugar stays. We know the conversion of the sugar to carbon dioxide and water would release energy. So this reaction would be favored, but we don't observe it. So the sugar stays there. And the reason is that the uh, sugar needs to pass an energy barrier. So here, and I think if you, for instance, put sugar to a flame, everyone has seen or done that, right? So you know the smell. This is a way to supply the energy. And at the same time, time in our bodies, sugar is continuously, or sugars are continuously converted to carbon dioxide and water. This is the mass balance of our metabolism. And this shows us enzymes can uh, lower this energy barrier. This is how they make this reaction possible. And with this, they can make reactions possible under very mild reaction conditions in our bodies at a neutral pH and 37 degrees, as opposed to burning sugars at high, uh, at high temperatures, which is, of course, a very drastic condition. So a good catalyst is characterized by its capacity to catalyze many turnovers. So we have our enzyme. And it binds a substrate, so to the enzyme substrate complex. And this then gives rise to the product and the free enzyme, and the enzyme can participate in the next cycle. So because of this, catalysts are called in Chinese or uh, with the uh, Chinese characters for a marriage broker, because a marriage broker makes a process possible, but leaves this process unaltered and can afterwards go for the next marriage, or in our case, for the next conversion. And a simple, a simple property of a good catalyst is, of course, we want this catalyst to, con to catalyze many, many turnovers, as many as possible. And actually, for an industrial process, we need turnovers in the thousands or even in the millions. So it is sometimes difficult to measure moles. So, of course, we want to know how many moles of product we can make with one mole of enzyme. But if we have an immobilized enzyme or say if we extract from a fungus which produces our enzyme, we, some, we often do not know how much enzyme we have. So, therefore, the productivity of a biocatalyst is expressed as the gram product per gram enzyme. Or in different words, if we make one kilogram of biomass uh, containing our enzyme, how many tons of product can we produce? So the biocatalyst productivity relates the product formation by the biocatalyst to the cost of its preparation. So then we have to talk what makes a good process for enzyme production. And in any product process, we have an important a parameter, which is the volumetric productivity. This is the amount of product that can be produced in a reactor at a given time. So this tells us something about the cost of the reactor. If our um, process takes three days, we can do it every week. So we can do 
we can start the reactor 52 times per year. And then if we know the volumetric productivity, we know precisely how many grams of enzyme can be produced in a year. Yeah. And then we know, for instance, how much money we pay for the maintenance of the fermenter, how much was the invest, how much is the salary of the technician supervising it, so how what are the overheads, etc. And um, for this, we need a very high volumetric productivity. Or in different words, we want to produce a lot of enzymes in a volume in a given time. So the volumetric productivity relates production to the cost of the reaction system. Then, what is the source of our enzyme? We can sometimes go for the wild-type organism. So um, papayas produce a protease so called papain, and this is used as a meat tender variable. So you can add on a steak, and the protease will digest the fibers and make the meat softer. Uh, actually, if you want, uh, when you're in a supermarket, you can check in the spice department. Usually they have meat tenderizer and the ingredients say it's papain. So papain can be isolated from papaya, so which means papayas are cultivated in large numbers because we eat them, and some of them we take and we isolate the papaya. So in this case, extraction from the wild type is a good process. In a similar uh, approach, pig livers can be taken. And these livers contain a lot of an esterase. And with a simple acetone extraction, we can get a lot of esterase from a pig. However, however um, there are some ethical considerations here because several people do not like to eat meat. So any product containing our esterase will not be vegetarian. And particularly talking about pigs, any product produced with this esterase will not be kosher or halal. And then there is the... Um, there would be a certain contamination risk. So, for instance, for the production of pharmaceutical ingredients, we are not allowed anymore to use any animal materials. So, in this case, the production in the pigs is not a good option, and therefore it's better to go for a recombinant process. So, this photo here shows a fermenter at the Institute of Molecular Biotechnology at the TU Graz. And the uh, best way to produce this pig level esterase is to produce this in a microorganism in a tank producing this under controlled sterile conditions. And this is the way how most industrial um, enzymes are nowadays produced. So let's get back what makes a good enzyme. I already explained to the biocatalyst productivity. We also want to achieve a high volumetric productivity in the enzymatic process. So there are a bit more aspects to that as will be explained later on by my colleagues from bioprocess engineering. But for the time being, let's just focus on these two aspects. One is how much enzyme do I need to produce a certain amount of product? And here, in a certain um, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a fermenter, in a certain amount of time, how much uh, can I produce? So this tells me something about how much I can use my fermenter. And the other aspect is also what will be the product concentration at the end of the process, which means how difficult will it be to isolate the product. Enzymes have different properties that are related to these two. So for instance, uh, we want to have a high reaction rate because we want to produce a lot of product. We want sometimes also to be the selective because we want only to produce one product out of several possible ones. Or we want it to convert only one functional group out of many in the molecule. And we want it maybe to convert only one out of several similar functional groups. For instance, if our molecule has an amine group and an alcohol, we want only to convert one of the two. So these selectivities actually are a reason why enzymes are used in the first place. Then we might have a unique reactivity we cannot find with a different catalyst then an enzyme should be stable. So we do not only want, we, we want it, of course, to be active, but we also want it to live long in the tank, which is also important to produce a lot of product. We also want it sometimes to be stable to solvents, and we want to be able to produce it in microorganisms, and we want it to store a long time, so we want to, what well, the customer wants to buy it once, put it into a fridge, and then use it over years. So if it has to be used within three weeks, this is not very attractive. And the enzyme should not be inhibited. This is a bit more complex, but if we want to pre um, suffice to say that enzymes in our metabolism are optimized for low substrate concentrations, but here in a, typical, in a good process, we want to convert a 50 gram per liter or a 100 gram per liter, and then the enzyme should not have a substrate or a product inhibition. So the selectivity is 
that is in the reactivity, this is the reason why we use enzymes in the first place. Because we can do something we cannot do with chemical catalyst, this is a very good reason to use an enzyme. And these parameters, they are related to the performance of the enzyme. And um, uh, performance of the enzyme, and in very simple words, the enzyme is only successful if we can produce it in large amounts in a cheap in an inexpensive way, if the enzyme is very stable and if it has a high rate. So the um, these properties are determined by the structure of the enzyme, the three-dimensional structure. And the uh, second answer to the question, what is an enzyme, of this lecture is an enzyme is a molecule. So you see here uh, a screenshot of the structure of an enzyme. You see here some amino acids are highlighted. And um, amino acids are molecules that consist of amino um, enzymes are molecules that consist of amino acids, and we have amino acids with different properties. We have some hydrophobic amino acids They're here. We have a sulfur, some of the aromats. We have a phenol. We have charged amino acids, positively and negatively charged amino acids, and we have some polar amino acids. And we have what we call, call special cases where, for instance, have sulfur, a cysteine. We have glycine, which is very flexible, and we have proline, which is an airline. So these amino acids, they determine the properties of the enzyme. And it's also important to know is that the context of the amino acids in the enzyme can also influence their properties. So in solution, um, an amino acid has certain properties. For instance, a cysteine has a pKa here, it says, of around 8. I don't know if I read this correctly. However, in, an, in the enzyme, the cysteine can interact with other amino acids, and this can change the pKa value quite significantly, for instance, up to 12. So this means nature uses a very restricted set of amino acids, but changes the properties by the, by the interaction, by the context. And this allows, actually, nature to catalyze a vast amount of reaction with enzymes only having this very limited set of 20 amino acids. So, and in very simple words, we can change the properties of enzymes by exchanging these amino acids, putting in here amino acids with different properties, and this then changes the structure of the enzyme and also its function. So, this gives us, brings us to the third answer. Enzymes, what is an enzyme? An enzyme is a protein, and uh, there are other biomolecules that can catalyze reactions. There are ribozymes, but for this uh, MOOC, we only focus on protein enzymes. This means we have here our amino acid sequence. This determines the structure, and the structure in turn determines the function. And this is also a bit of a challenge because it is not easy to make an accurate prediction of a structure. So with de novo structure prediction, just to say alpha fold or zeta fold, we can um, make very plausible product, uh, predictions of many enzymes, but it is still very difficult to clearly predict for instance, what would be the, the effect of the exchange of this glycine to an alanine? And then once we have a good structure, usually our um, uh, the structures we have are static and enzymes are very dynamic molecules. And this means it is very, very difficult, even with good structural information, to make an accurate prediction of the function. So this is a challenge and this is also what makes enzyme engineering so uh, interesting. So if we talk about how to pr improve an enzyme, we actually should talk about how to improve an enzymatic process. And there are two levels where we can work. The one is the molecular biotechnology. So this means we engineer the biosystem of the process, which is here can be the engineering of the cell or metabolism, or we engineer the protein by changing the amino acids. Then we also need to look at the enzyme in its context. We need to look at the bioprocess. So, for instance, the bioprocess tells us how can we extract the product at the end of the process, which means what kind of product concentration do we need to achieve in order to make the process attractive. And this then gives us back an information, how much product do we need to produce? And also, for instance, um, should, we, should we engineer our enzyme against inhibitions? So, in a successful biotechnology, always molecular disciplines interact very closely with engineering disciplines. So the the enzyme engineering, the 
it goes hand in hand with the bioprocess engineering. And this means we have to work across discipline barriers, which also makes work in biotechnology very interesting. So this basic module um, deals now first with the production of an enzyme and its engineering. Then it will, we'll talk about biocatalysis, and then we will go on to process engineering. And this unit here deals what is, with the question, what is an enzyme? You already got several answers. And then I want to talk a bit about the choice of the enzyme production host and also to produce enzymes in genetically modified microorganisms. And then very shortly, we'll tell you how we can change an enzyme by rational protein design and directed enzyme evolution. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and hope you will enjoy the following modules. And thank, of course, also the European Union uh, for funding. So this MOOC is, is created as a part of the Marie Curie ITN interfaces. And therefore, I would like to thank the European Union for making it possible. Mm -hmm.